Welcome to Impact the World, the show for and about creatives, change makers, and entrepreneurs. This is a conversation episode where a special guest shares with me what they are creating and the behind the scenes journey of their experience. Hi, welcome to Impact the World. Today's guest is Corin Fox who is doing so many different things in the world that her journey as a multidimensional creator is a fascinating one. And she's doing some really wonderful things at a young age. So it was so great to get to speak to her about what the experience of doing all of that is like. And we spoke just as she was about to launch her new podcast, Am I Doing This Right? And as you will see, that very question is one of the things that we share, that the journey of a creator is often fraught with. So it was great to get to speak to Corinne. I hope you enjoy the show and you can find her website at foxtails.com. And as ever, we'll put the links in the show notes. Enjoy the show. Corinne, thank you so much for joining us today. I was really excited to have you on the show for for various reasons, but I think a couple of things. You know, at your age, you know, your mid-20s, you have so many different things going on as an entrepreneur, as a creative, um, but also one of the big things that you've been really passionate and outspoken about in recent years has been alongside women's rights and women's equality, you've been really passionate about mental health. And this has been something that has been a driving force for you. So I was excited to see how you're doing what you're doing in the world. But before we kind of go into the things you do and some of the causes that are really important to you, how are you doing? Like in this crazy (laughs) year of 2020 that has been like, you know, beyond the beyond for all of us in in many different ways. How are you doing on just a day-to-day basis with the world and being in the world right now? Um, I think just like everyone, it's been such a learning experience. Every day I feel like it's different. And, you know, in March I thought, you know, everything will be fine by May. And then in May, everything will be fine by July. And, you know, now it just keeps going on and on. And, you know, I think what I've learned so, so much about myself. It's been a great time of reflection and really getting in tune with what's important for me and what's important to me and what I actually, like you said, I do so many things and I feel like I get overwhelmed with them during normal life. And this has been such a great opportunity for me to slow down and be like, what are the things that really are important to me? Where do I want to go? And so even though it is, you know, very scary right now and there's so much going on and so much uncertainty, I do feel like there's an alignment happening for me, which has been really, I feel like I I wouldn't have had this experience without everything going on. So, but again, also good days, bad days. (laughs) Yeah, right. Human, the human experience in all of its complexity. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, it's, it's interesting because I know that we're talking to you today in the very room where you are right now birthing a podcast that by the time this show comes out, will have, um, will have already been out in the world. And I love the title. <laughs> it's called, Am I Doing This Right? Tell us yes. a little bit about that. So Am I Doing This Right is actually like one of my quarantine babies. Um, I had three big projects that I worked on during that like self-isolation period that we had at the beginning of the year. One of them being the podcast, one of those being that being one of the projects that I felt really was in tune with who I wanted to be. And so Am I Doing This Right is a life how-to podcast from the perspective of non-experts. So Mm. it is my best friend and I, and we're exploring all these different topics that we felt like we had no clue how to do. You know, I'm in my mid-20s figuring out how to file my taxes, how to, you know, what's the process of buying my first home, like all these things that you don't really learn in college. You kind of have to figure out when you graduate. 
And my girlfriend and I were always calling each other like, hey, am I doing this right? Hey, am I doing this right? You know, I, I'm trying to figure this out. And we thought, you know, why not create a podcast that can kind of be like a guidebook for young people in navigating adulthood and figuring out these things. And we do it with like a glass of wine every episode <laughs> to yeah. kind of make it light and fun. And so, yeah, we are covering heavy topics or maybe – confusing topics, but we do it in a lighthearted, fun way. And we're in no way experts. And I feel like there's a lot of how-to podcasts out there that are from an expert, like people who are in their middle age and, you know, it's hard to relate to them. It's like, yeah, it's easy for you. You've had years of experience. What about somebody in their mid twenties trying to figure this stuff out? So, um, one of my passion projects, one of my babies from quarantine that has now birthed itself. And yes, I'm in this makeshift podcast studio at my parents' home. Very millennial of me. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm really, really excited for it. That's brilliant. I love it. I wish it had been around when I was in my mid-20s, but I'm also, I will be tuning in anyway, just because it sounds like something that any of us could tune in on regardless of age, right? Yo, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we, we are covering topics too that aren't just necessarily like life how-tos. We cover like voter suppression in mm-hmm. uh, one of our episodes and we really talk about what it is, where it came from, what's going on right now. Obviously, there's an huge election coming up. And these are things that, again, you're not really taught at school about. And um, so, so yeah, there's, there's no age for listening to the podcast. We made it for ourselves, but it's really open to everyone. Yeah. What has been like a big learning curve or a big surprise to you about becoming a podcast producer and host? (laughs) <laughs> my, <laughs> my co-host and I, we always say we want to make a, am I doing this right podcast episode? Because the whole process of figuring it out has been so interesting. Um, gosh, I would, I would say in terms of the biggest hurdle we had was a lot of the technical stuff, like equipment. I mean, even setting up the equipment was, it should have been a comedy sketch. Like it was... <laughs> We had no idea what we were doing. Um, And so it's been, it's been interesting, but it's just such a unique way to connect with people in such a real way and and to really have your voice heard. And so I love, love, love the platform and the medium of podcasting. Yeah. And it's funny because in a way, both the title of the show (laughs) and what you have just told us to me is like the thing that you just have to be willing to push through as a creator in any endeavor. Or oh, yeah. learning to file your taxes. It's like that question is going to come up. The difference is if you let that question intimidate you or make you stop, or if you're like, oh God, today's going to be a slow progress day, but I have to figure this piece out so that then tomorrow I can put the next piece down. Like I think that's that's the art of creativity. And and I think it's the it's kind of like the, the the small text that you don't get when you have this lovely vision <laughs> of like, oh, I'm going to do this thing and it's going to be great. Yeah. And you're going to have to do a lot of chop wood, carry water and stuff that you don't really understand. But I, I think that's what makes it so fulfilling when you do complete. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I would say that's what we talk about in the podcast and why we really wanted to make it. We feel like information empowers people and we felt so empowered when we figured these things out on our own, yes, there's trial and error. Yes, there were days. I mean, literally last night I was on the phone with her like, I can't do this. We can't get it to upload. Like just all those little intricacies that can get frustrating. But when you do figure it out, you feel so empowered. And now you have this knowledge. And then because of that, we just wanted to share it with the world. And so that's where am I doing this right came from. Yeah. It's funny because, you know, multidimensionality is a word I didn't know 25 years ago. But I think certainly creatively, I was a multidimensional creator, like from an early age, and that was just inbuilt. But then when I started doing spiritual work and spiritual teachings and I was channeling the Z's, they would talk all the time about your world is going to become more multidimensional and you're going to see and people are going to become more multidimensional. So it was just hitting me. You know, as I was prepping for speaking to you today and looking at the list of all the things that you do, that that's kind of like you look at it, it's like, wow, it's like such a range of things that you have done and are doing. Were you always wired that way from a young age? Like, have you always been 
into a little bit of everything? Or is that, is that like a new emergence for you? That's a great question. I wonder if it is a millennial thing. I'm not sure if it's like a generational thing, um, not wanting to commit to one thing <laughs> and trying to be everything. Um, I don't know if I was innately like that. I think as I got older, um, I, I originally actually, when I graduated college, I got a job, at, a nine to five job in New York in advertising. And that's what I was going to do. And I remember looking out the window and was at my desk and going, I don't want to do this. And so I moved back to LA and I just, I feel like the old model and I'm also an actor and was like, you're just an actor. That's what you're going to be. And you have to go down that path. And I just saw just such an expansion. You can be an actor, a producer, an activist. You can be so many things now and they all work together and they're all um, harmonious. And and so I just decided I wasn't going to limit myself and the right things were going to stick and the wrong things, you know, I could let go. And so I've literally tried everything <laughs> or, yeah. or am trying everything. Yeah. And that is so much more this time. And if you think about it, it just mirrors our lives because most of us are perhaps a brother, a spouse, a parent. Uh, right. you know, there, there are so many roles we have in our just personal life that it doesn't make sense that we should limit what we can do in the outside world. And you mentioned producing. I know that you're producing with Netflix right now. Yes. What is that like? Because, you know, Netflix is a you know, prestigious company and I'm guessing that's one of the biggest things you've ever produced so far. It's the first thing I've ever produced. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. So it's my first time producing, um, obviously, a very big project. It's a sitcom with Netflix that is, I would say loosely, but honestly, pretty pretty close to my real life. Uh -huh. um, right now, it's called Dad Stop Embarrassing Me, but it will, I think the title will change by the time it comes out. Dad Stop but, Embarrassing Me. <laughs> yeah. So... Um, yeah, it's based on my childhood, and uh, there's like a 14-year-old version of me and my dad playing uh, my dad, and we just took all these stories that we had. My dad's kind of a very flamboyant, big personality guy, and there's been so many situations in my life in which he's embarrassed me, <laughs> Right. Um, and we just took these funny stories and made episodes out of it, and uh, it's my first time producing, and I had to cast someone to essentially play a version of me, which was such a cool process. And we found someone really great and she's absolutely killing it. And, um, but yeah, I think working with a big company like Netflix can be intimidating. I'm the only female producer. So that's, you know, finding my voice and really learning to speak up in a big room has been a huge learning curve for me. So how many people would be in that room that you're the only female producer in? Um, there's about three or four for um, other producers and they're all men, older men. So I'm a young, <laughs> I'm a young woman. And so um, definitely the first couple of days or actually weeks of production, I was very intimidated, not because they were doing anything. They're so sweet and lovely, but just feeling like, why am I here? What am I doing? How do I, am I doing this right? And um, yeah. exactly. And I think I really have found my voice and I actually, every time I drive to work, I like hold my steering wheel and I'm like, I have a voice and it should be heard and don't be afraid to speak up, Corinne. And so I've really enjoyed the process of producing. That's great. And is your dad playing your dad? He's playing a version of him. It's right. not his exactly him, but he's playing a version of him. And there's a version of me at 14 and uh, kind of our fictional family, which are all based on real family members. And it's, it's really funny. Right. And I should explain for anyone watching that Corinne's um, father is Jamie Foxx, who is yes. an actor and um, and a very good actor and a very known <laughs> actor. We just watched his movie um, a couple of weeks ago. and I Just Mercy. Oh, yeah. Amazing. Amazing. It's, Heartbreaking and amazing all at the same time. It. I was in the theater sobbing. It's yeah. so, so good. He's so incredibly talented and he can do so much. And he um, came from comedy, came from like sitcoms. And so he's really excited to go back and do comedy again. Like that's his first love. And so it's exciting for him. Which by the way, I'm a, I, I really love the Graham Norton show, which was like, you know, a tradition. I would sit and watch it with my parents 20 years ago in England. So ever since I've moved to the States, you know, it's one of my favorite things to do. Like every now and then, if I just need to switch off, I'll watch him and his guests because it always entertains me. 
And your dad was a hilarious guest with him. So that, that makes total sense to me. Oh, he's always performing like constantly. Right. He's always on, like, that's not just a facade, like at home, he's never off. He's always on. <laughs> that's hilarious. So for you growing up in that, I'm sure that has challenges. Mm. Like what would you say were the gifts and the, the gifts and perhaps the challenges of growing up in and around that as, as, a, as a young person? Um, you know, I think because of where my career landed in the entertainment industry, a big gift was that I knew what to expect, um, going into this. My dad gave me such a very clear perspective on, on how this thing works. And, you know, it's a complicated industry and there's highs and lows. And I feel like I really, really knew what I was, what to expect going into all of this, um, and obviously I got to go to premieres when I was younger and it was really fun. I think what I experienced when I was younger were a lot of the challenges of it. Um, people really looked at me differently. I, at least I felt that they did or yeah. they expected me to be a certain way, to be uppity or um, spoiled or all of these things. And I was very self-conscious of my dad's career for a very, very long time. It, it isn't until recently that I've been able to fully embrace it, but I was super self-conscious of it. I wouldn't want to talk to people about him or his work or anything. I wanted to just be my own person. Mm. And so I felt very, very defined by his career for so long. And then as I got older, I really started to embrace it and just see how beautiful of, a, of an entertainer he is. And his body of work is so impressive. And I really, really look up to him now. That's great. And it's interesting you're talking about his body of work. And here we are with you mm -hmm. just at 26 with these things already around you, the, 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 the things you've been doing in the last like six, seven years. And I'm, I'm, I'm super curious to see where your body of work is in 10 or 20 years. And um, I think one of the things I really love about the varied things that you do. So, for example, I went to your website, foxtails.com. Yeah. And that's um, foxxtales.com. And like any show, if you're watching or listening, check the show notes and we'll put links to where to find Corinne's work. Um, I really loved that you had several articles. You call them badass women articles. And it was, it was really celebrating powerful women and highlighting them and highlighting their voices. And that, that's something that seems to be a thread. You do it in social media, you do it in your website, you do it in your podcast. Where did that come from for you? What seeded that? I have two younger sisters. They are 11 and 12. And so they're a lot younger than me. And I partnered with Girl Up. They're a United Nations foundation uh, dedicated to empowering young women as activists and leaders. Um, I partnered with them about four years ago. And so I'm an ambassador for them. And I work with them a lot. And it came from my sisters. Mm -hmm. And wanting them to feel like they can do anything in the world. And I tell them this all the time and they roll their eyes at me and they're like, okay, sissy, we get it. But really um, I didn't have, I was like an only child until I was 14 or 15. So basically most of my life. And I never had like somebody, like, I mean, I had my parents, but I, I never had like an older sister to look to. And so I always have just wanted to inspire them as much as possible. And I think it's really come from them and, and wanting to show them one people that look like them. So I, I feature a lot of black women mm. and, um, and just showing them that they, they can succeed and, and, and really be whoever they want. So it really comes from them. Mm. It's powerful. It's powerful and it's strong. And, you know, I loved what you said about, um, you know, being in the room as the only female producer and the youngest producer, but you're doing it. And that's fantastic. And, and I love that even with the hesitation um, that any of us would have, that you're still, you're doing it. That's why I'm really curious to see in like a decade from now what you're up to. Ms. Me Ms. too. I would love yeah. to know what I'm up to a decade from now. <laughs> it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to be good. Um, not that it isn't now, but one of the things on your Instagram account I wanted to pull up with you, I saw you did this, um, this live conversation called taking action and taking care why self-care isn't an excuse to tune out mm. I thought, wow that's brilliant a brilliant piece of wording around i would say the challenge of this time because i think overwhelm overwhelm makes 
all of us need or sometimes want to tune out. Um, Self-care is really important anyway, and I think it's becoming a more understood thing in the world, but it's still misunderstood and some people see it as selfish or, oh, I haven't got time to self-care. And it's like, well, if you don't self-care even in teeny tiny ways, um, you're going to run into trouble. But I think it's also, it can, I see this in the spiritual community um, as well, it can be an excuse to shut your eyes um, mm-hmm. for what's going on and what's needed. And I'm, I'm all about I'm all about that we all have very different positions. I don't think everybody is a, should be a frontline activist. Um, and I, I, I don't think everybody's built that way. But why self-care isn't an excuse to tune out? Tell me what that meant to you and what that conversation was about. Yeah, so that was a conversation I had with April Walker. She's a, a female Black designer uh, of a company called Walker Wear. And the conversation we had was essentially she at one point with her business felt like she needed to step away to take care of her own mental health, was kind of overwhelmed um, with what was happening. Um, And so we talked about that decision, what that looked like for her. But we also talked about how even though she had to step away, she was still at the heartbeat of what was happening in the Black community and what was happening in the Black fashion community specifically. Um, And so even though she was taking time for herself, she still was being active in her community. Mm-hmm. And 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 what was around her, and so I think there is this balance of, you know, the, the self care movement, which is so great, and I'm so happy about because when I started working with NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, these conversations weren't happening mm-hmm. um, at all. People weren't talking about self care; they weren't talk, talking about mental health. And I'm really really happy to see that, but yeah, sometimes it does feel like people use that as a shield when they're scared. Um, to look at what's happening in the world. And I will even say for myself, there was a period when all of this, um, you know, this this social revolution that's happening right now, um, it's so beautiful, but there was a point in which I got overwhelmed by it. And I was like, I can't look at the news for a few days and I can't, like, this is just too much to handle. Mm -hmm. Um, So I understand that. And I think it's all a balance. Like you have to figure out what works for you. But I think being aware that you can take care of yourself, but also be aware of what's happening around you and hold space for that too. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think it, it, it's, it's knowing your own overwhelm too. It's like mm-hmm. you get those overwhelm signals, knowing you do just need to step back or not look at the news for a few days or whatever it, whatever it takes. Um, it's so vital. So you mentioned NAMI and that's something that you started in 2017, but mm-hmm. very, very uh, important this year. I, I, it's funny, isn't it, how certain crises in our lives or in our world bring something to the forefront that perhaps has always been there, but has never really had its moment. And there are so many moments that are happening this year. And one of them is, I think, people's mental health, because one of the biggest concerns that is not often spoken about around what's going on with COVID, we talk about the economic, the health implications, but we don't talk about the mental health crisis and the aftermath um, Mm -hmm. of of this period of time. So can you share a little bit about NAMI and and how you got involved and and what they stand for and what they do? Yeah. So I'm an ambassador for NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. They're the largest grassroots mental health organization in the country. And um, I've been working with them since 2017. They reached out uh, for me to partner with them on a campaign just because of, you know, my name, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I reached back out to them because I've struggled with anxiety since I was 14. And I really saw that as my call to action. I was like, I can't just, you know, post on Instagram and say, hey, support this cause without being authentic. And I I came back to them. I said, Hey, you know what? I actually have anxiety. I've had it since I was 14. I want to partner with you in in an authentic way. I want this to be real. And so I actually, our first partnership was an article I wrote for Refinery29 about my anxiety experience. And that was hands down one of the serious things I'd ever done because at the time there wasn't a conversation for mental health, like you were saying. And I thought people were going to call me the C word, which is crazy. 
Mm. And um, I had so much fear about it. But when I posted that article, so many people reached out, people I knew, people I didn't know, and they were just like, thank you. Thank you for saying that you've been struggling. Thank you for for coming out and, and talking about this because I have bipolar and I have depression and I, and all of these people. And I was like, wow, there was a conversation needed, um, about this topic and people are so desperate to connect and made me feel less alone and and just realized how, how connected this human experience is. Yeah. And it's amazing, isn't it? How, when we do share, it's incredible what tumbles out of our mouths that we're going through that you don't know about the person that you're sitting next to talking about something suddenly when you learn what their feelings are it 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 humanizes and connects us all in a really deep way but but there's there's still not enough of it you know one of my big moments was the oprah show when i was 16 and as a as a as a pretty internally tormented teenager at that time with a lot of stuff that I was going to have to unpack and heal in the in the next decade, mm-hmm. um, I it was oxygen to me to hear her with her studio audience, which was really what the show was back then, um, talking about real stuff and living in England at the age of sixteen. I, you know, people in England were not running to talk about their feelings, so right. <laughs> this was like oxygen to me. I was like, oh my god, people are actually talking about how they feel. But it's interesting that, you know, you bring up that word crazy because one of the one of the things that I have noticed that is used in journalism that is used in uh social language that we use is crazy is like the scary word it's like you don't want to be branded crazy because crazy has had historically serious consequences whether you know whether it's as simple but still as super painful as social ostracization go back few decades and crazy could have got you in all kinds of trouble um with the law with hospitals you know it's it's like a i i see how that word is used um very covertly um to to silence us about talking about certain things and you see it now too with things that people want to share on social media they're immediately branded crazy rather than people going oh maybe we should consider this line of thought so um it's interesting that that's something that was in your mind even as recently as three years ago, which just shows how how much it still is out there for us. But thank God it's breaking down. Yeah, I, I do. I agree with you on it, but I do really, I have seen such a big change in the last three years. Um, I really do see this conversation for mental health finally happening. Um, I think people are being aware of, of using words like crazy loosely, um, Mm. which has been really great, you know, calling people, oh, she's crazy. Oh, you know, I had a panic attack over that when you didn't really, you were just upset or just all these words that were not we weren't aware of before. And I think people are more conscious about using. Mm. And and it's interesting you say she's crazy because it's something that gets dumped on women. Oh uh, yeah. Like nine times out of 10. Yeah. If, if it's, if that word's going to be used, it's, it's kind of a, a yeah, to women. Uh, mm-hmm. It's kind of a thing or has been. So absolutely. Yeah, it's yet another thing that we're all learning to grow through and undo in ourselves. Right. Another, another 2020 element. But I, and that's what I, I, I love about 2020 is I I do think we, because we're forced to be a lot more still, like there's so much more room for reflection and, and looking at ourselves and maybe the parts that we don't love about ourselves and just saying, where is this coming from? And how can I be better? At least that's how I've spent it. Um, And I feel like we are going to come out of this collectively so much more awakened and aware and conscious of other beings and other people here. Um, so I, at least that's what I'm looking forward to. No, I'm with you. I, I'm, I'm having the same experience personally, and I'm, I'm seeing that around. So it's, mm-hmm. it's good. Uh, we met in 2018, and you came to our Soul Magic Retreat in Costa Rica. So I'd never met you before. And I'm curious, was spirituality a, a big part of your life? If, you know, how, how long has spirituality and and um, self growth been been something that you've been actively seeking? Yeah, it's been a part of my 
entire growing up experience, my mom um, was very deep and is still very deep into like the new thought movement. Mm. And so uh, I grew up going to a church or a non-denominational spiritual center, Agape. Oh, yeah. With Reverend um, Michael Beckwith. And so when I was younger, not a lot of people really that I knew, my friends, no one was really into it. And it was kind of the weird like hippie stuff. Um, And so I kind of didn't really share it with people. And it was kind of this very personal thing that was just in my family. And again, I do think there's this movement happening where so many people are so much more aware of spirituality, are embracing it so much more. There's an open conversation about it, which is so exciting because I'm like, I've grown up on this stuff. Um, But yeah, I I went to uh, Soul Magic in 2018 and it was hands down one of the most pivotal moments of my entire life. Um, I had went through this very big breakup of being with someone for five years and had never been on my own. I'd always went from relationship to relationship. And I was guided to soul magic. I went by myself. I don't think my parents knew where I was um, fully. They knew I was in Costa Rica, but they don't think they really like knew exactly where I was. I got on a plane and I remember I cried the entire plane right there because I was just like, what am I doing? I'm alone. And I went and one met so many amazing people that I'm still in contact with today, but also just the workshops that you led were so, so pivotal for me. I mean, it was just, I can't go, I go on and on about it all the time to all my friends and I rave about it. It was truly, truly life-changing for me. And when I got back, Three weeks later, I booked my first lead role in a movie, and I directly contributed to that trip. All I feel like all the awakenings I had there, it literally manifested instantly. (laughs) Awesome, and and thank you, and for us too. Like you know, for me and my team who who have the privilege of getting to lead that every year, it's you know, it takes me weeks to kind of (laughs) weeks initially, and then months to kind of integrate what, 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 what we all get to experience and blue spirit is extraordinary. Um, Yes. I love that facility. It's just, uh, but, but it's funny because, you know, I, you remind me, I remember taking my first big trip when I was in my early twenties, I went to this place called Iona and it was at the end of a very difficult relationship. And my father was sick and it was just one of those and I I remember being absolutely scared witless going and thinking why the hell am I going up here by myself for a week but I did and yeah it's those pivotal trips isn't it that I think move a lot of energy in our lives I I think when you kind of bet on yourself and you take that leap of faith you're always rewarded and uh it's so funny to, i i read that journal that i i brought to mm. uh costa rica all the time and like the first page is like what am i doing and oh my gosh and all this stuff and then the way back i'm like this was the most grounding healing experience and it's so cool to see that evolution over a week um yeah. so yeah i think when you kind of just bet on yourself and you say you know i'm worth it and i can do this and you, you get rewarded. Beautiful, beautiful. And what was the movie? What was the storyline of the movie? I'm curious. Uh, it was a, it's a shark movie. <laughs> ah. I did, uh, it's called 47 Meters Down Uncaged. It came out last summer. Uh-huh. Um, but it was my first lead role in a movie. Uh-huh. And that was one of the things I was kind of manifesting on that trip was like, you know, I wanted to really move into acting and make that my main career and um, source of income. And it was crazy. I literally got a phone call like, can you come to uh, the Dominican Republic tomorrow and film this lead role? Like out of just dropped out of the sky. So three weeks after coming back from Costa Rica, which was insane. Well, what's hilarious about that story is it was on Iona that I had this whole past life replay thing of like Mm -hmm. being eaten in the ocean. So I, so, and it's been with me ever since. By a shark? I assume it was very dark gray. It didn't look like the sharks in the movies. And at first I thought, I'm, I'm clearly making this up. I must be influenced. But it's, it's a whole experience that I won't bore you with now, but it kept replaying for me over days. It was one of my first past life bleed throughs. And I was very little. I had, I had brown skin. I, I think maybe I was Indian or South American or something. Mm-hmm. And I was maybe child. And I just, I, could, I can still feel the water as I'm being like, it, I'm gripped here and I'm being, Kind of, uh, anyway, but 
but that's where I got bit on the movie, right oh, on my really? side. Oh my god! So I'm gonna have to. Oh, I was gonna tell you. I'm gonna have to watch this. You movie. don't have to watch. Like, no, I force myself to watch them sometimes, and now you're in it, and it's connected to Costa Rica. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna have to, that's gonna be some therapy for me. Did you uh, Did you enjoy making it? Yeah, you know, um, I didn't know how to swim before I made the movie. The entire movie is underwater. And we wow. shot it underwater. Um, it's We're scuba diving. The premise is that we go scuba diving in these caves and get stuck. And there's sharks in the caves. Oh, my um, God. I can't, I'm, I'm, oh, this is going to be awful. Okay. Sorry. I'm just... <laughs> Go ahead, carry on. <laughs> no, but um, I kind of, I kind of fudged my way onto the set. The director was like, "Hey, you know how to swim?" And I was like, "Yes, totally know how to swim." And then I got there, and they threw me in a tank the first day, and I was like paddling for dear life. But I did figure it out, and I learned how to scuba dive, and spent five hours every day under the surface of the water, which was insane. Um, I don't know if I'll ever <laughs> do anything like that again, but it was such a. a very rewarding, physically rewarding um, first movie. I, I love that, that it's all about, it's a shark movie and you were very method because, you know, you and the water already had this interesting relationship. That's perfect. Yeah. Great. So um, I'm curious, um, what are you excited about in the year to come? I mean, you have so many different things going on, but like perhaps we We've talked about some of the projects you have going on, like on a personal level. What are you What are you excited about for this next year ahead for you? Great question. I just got my first place on my own, and I feel like I'm stepping into. I'm already a very independent person, if you can't tell, but I feel like I've really found my voice and I've found my footing. And so I feel like I'm really excited to see how that keeps showing up and how I can continue to just feel out my voice a little bit more. Um, one of the one of my biggest biggest dreams in, in that I'm trying to manifest and that's guiding me is I want to be a senator one day. I want to be in public service and public policy. I feel like that's one of the best ways to make change is to change the law. And um, so I'm excited to see how that kind of moves in, in and out of my life and continuing my ambassador work, but also stepping more into politics and seeing how that all works out. So yeah, I think just finding my voice and, and staying true to my purpose and not being afraid. I think I read something the other day that it was like, oh, I can't remember the exact wording and I'm going to butcher it, but it was like going following like your soul's purpose, even if it's not what your ego wanted, hmm. which was a big one for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And that's, I think often when we listen to our soul, it, it does that brilliant job of dismantling certain ego things for us along the way. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, there's, uh, there's another, the, the, I'm going to butcher this, but someone said something many, many years ago that stuck with me and it said, your soul doesn't care if your ego is having a bad day. And I thought, yes, oh, yeah, absolutely true. Because actually, you know, that your ego having a bad day is, is like a gift day. It's like a transformation day. It's like a lightening up and loosening up day if you can move through it rather than stay stuck in it and create behaviors around it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. I think that's part of just getting older every year, you know, moving into my, from my mid twenties to like my late twenties and just being more purposeful about everything I'm doing and all these things you think you want, you know, start becoming a lot less important. And, um, yeah, it's, it's fun growing up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I, I, the older I get, the, the, the more comfortable in my skin I feel around mm -hmm. being a human. Um, and I'm curious, I, there's something I meant to ask you a few questions ago and I forgot to pick up on it. You mentioned anxiety, and I was curious, you know, what worked for you around anxiety? Were there certain methods or tools or practices that you found? Because I think it's such a thing for, for so many of us on the planet, especially these days, even people who never had anxiety are beginning to experience it or talk about it. So curious, you know, what things have worked for you then or now? Yeah. So when I do my public speaking engagements, I actually pull this thing out. It's called my Corinne's Toolkit. Um, and it's these 10 
10 kind of tools that I have that I've actually developed with my therapist. Um, and they're just things that work for me when I'm feeling anxious and I can go to, and I'm like, okay, I'm feeling really anxious or I'm feeling really off today. I'm kind of panicky. What on my list have, haven't I done recently? And then, so they're, they're kind of basic things, but they're good reminders. And a lot of them are exercise and meditation was a game changer for me. Um, I really believe that it changed my brain, like the structure of my brain. Um, so yeah, exercise. How long have you been meditating? Um, I, I started meditating in 2016, mm. end of 2015, 2016 was really went through a really anxious period. Uh, I was just about to graduate from college, this big unknown. Um, and I was just having panic attacks and was just so anxious and meditation. I, truly saved me. It allowed me to stay in school or else I feel like I was going to have to take a semester off because I was just so overwhelmed. And I just am such a big advocate for it. And I know there's a lot of barriers to entry for people with meditation. You know, people think it's like levitating in your living room, which it's not, you know, it it can be a lot more simple and accessible to people than that. Yeah, well, the, you have to do it for an hour. Whereas actually, the truth is, if you do a five, 10 minute meditation every day, that's that alone is going to be a game changer. Yes, exactly. So I, I speak pretty openly and candidly about meditation and how important I think it is for everyone to do. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. And, and some of the other things were just like journaling and art and um, spirituality and seeing friends and family and, and just things that are seems like common knowledge, but when you're really anxious or in an anxious moment, you yeah. forget all of those things. So I literally have a note in my phone that's like, did you do this? Did you do that? Did you do that? Have you called somebody? And then um, then you kind of, I feel better by the end of it all. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for sharing some of those things because I know, I know, I know it's, you know, I think that's going to be part of the cultural conversation for a while, actually. I think, um, and tools for these things are, as we said earlier, it's a little bit how mental health and and wellness and spirituality are becoming a part of the focus of our daily lives. They don't have to be these separate things. They, it's actually really important they become integrated. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's interesting because when when you came to Soul Magic, uh, I experienced you in the room with everybody else, but I didn't really know what you did. And I I say this, and I'm 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 hesitant because I don't want this to sound patronizing because I'm older than you, but I'm, I'm so impressed by you. And I'm impressed by you, not just because of the things that you're doing, but perhaps more because of the fact that you're doing them with your vulnerability and your honesty and your heart intact, and you're doing them anyway. And I, and I, I actually think that's one of the hardest places to reach. I think it's easy to be ambitious and driven and like kind of have ego desires to do certain things that will block out all that stuff for you. But I I think it's, um, it's an incredible level of presence that you're carrying. And that's why I say I'm really excited to see what you're doing 10 years from now, um, as well as what you're doing a year from now. And yeah, it's just been such a pleasure to get to learn more about what you do and why you do it. And I really am sure that there will have been people listening or watching the show who will be uh, inspired to do their own thing um, and to take the plunge without worrying, am I doing this right? Because none <laughs> of us are doing this right. We're just, we're just, you know, we're doing it right. Yeah, ex- exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, thank you for saying that. I really appreciate it, and um, I really, obviously, look up to you and all the work that you do as well. And um, yeah, thank you for complimenting me because, again, I am wondering, am I doing this right <laughs> all <Yeah>. the time? <laughs> Yeah. And I honestly, it's one of the things I love telling people, like when they ask me, oh, well, you're really confident as a channeler. And I'm like, oh, I wasn't. I was absolutely terrified to come out as a channeler. That was the last thing in the world I wanted. But a bit like you, when I did do it, the amount of people who would confide in me or, you know, and even really unexpected people like CEOs of like big companies that would never talk about it publicly. They go, oh, I channel for myself privately. And it's how I've been running the company. And you know, so it's it, it's always that thing. I think that thing that we're scared to do, that we're always going to be scared. Like there's no question that some part of us isn't going to have a teeny tiny little bit of doubt or hesitation. Or a lot of doubt. <laughs> yeah, or a ton of it. And the reason yeah. I say a teeny bit is I think a lot of people are more, but, but even for me, like doing what I do on a daily basis, like you, there are all kinds of like moments. But 
But if you're compelled to do it and you know why you're doing it and it feels like the right thing to, I'm just like, hey, just do it. Because, yeah. we, you know, we don't know how long any of us are here. Um, we really don't. And that's, that's one of my, um, <laughs> it's one of my anti-anxiety phrases to myself. I, I use it a lot. I could be dead tomorrow. And that's not because oh, I'm goodness. fatalistic. It's because it's true. You know, yeah. I could be, none of us know. And I think we, in a way, our egos have been, guided into this idea oh this is my life and then when I'm 70 I'll have grandchildren yeah if you're here if if grandchildren you know I think these ideas that we've been fed about life are part of the breakdown right now so yeah. I think it's really important to just you know figure out what do I need today what can I give today you know yes I love what can I give today I I say that often and I say that and when I wake up there's like a few things that I do and one of them is what can I give because I feel like a lot of, we go through day, our days and it's like, what can I get? How can I get it? And um, it's a good way to kind of shift your your mindset going into the day. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Yeah. And then I think, you know, when you have certain basic needs met in your own life, I kind of think it becomes a kind of unwritten responsibility. You know, there have been times, a couple of more desperate times in my life when I needed to focus on survival in certain areas. But I think it's a, right. gift. It's a gift to be able to to, to give as well. And so if you're in a position to do that, it's whether it's a compliment or whether it's helping someone financially or practically or physically, that to me is like the best, like I giving that, that's just such a lovely energy to be part of. Yeah. No, I, I completely, I completely agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. It was beautiful to talk to you and congratulations on the launch of your podcast. And um, am I doing this right? Anybody listening or watching, you can find it on Apple Podcasts or anywhere that podcasts are streamed. And we'll put sh uh, links to all of Corinne's um, sites in the show notes. And I'm going to look out for the Netflix show that you're producing. Yes. And I also have a movie coming out on Disney Plus uh, very soon too. So keep Fantastic. your eye out for that. Right. What, what is that called? It, right now it's called Safety, but it might get uh, renamed. But right. look out for that. Will do. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so Thank much, you Karen. so much, Lee. Well, this has been awesome. Yeah, you take care. You have been listening to Impact the World. For more of my work, please visit leeharrisenergy.com. In 2018, I launched a course called Empaths vs. Narcissists, a power dynamic and how to recover from it. It's a video course and it's designed to support you to recover from any kind of relationship where you have given your power away. It's interesting because narcissism has been this big topic and I think it's very easy for any of us to just point the finger and label people. And it's also very complicated, you know, at any particular moment we can all have narcissistic tendencies or behave empathically. Why I created this course is time and time again I was meeting and working with so many people who had got themselves quite entangled into this unhealthy dynamic and had come out of it, didn't know how to recover from it, didn't quite know what had happened to them, but also didn't know what to rebuild in themselves in order to avoid walking back into it in the future. And I certainly had my own experiences around this. So the course is born of personal experience, my experience of working with one-on-one -on -one clients and groups around the world for several years on this topic. And it's delivered via video, audio, worksheets. And for 2020, we are launching again this fall in September. And it will be open for just over a month that you can enroll because we like to support the course live. So as each piece is delivered over the two months, me and my team can support you as you go through the process. There are also some bonus interviews that I'm adding this year with people who have particular expertise and experience around this dynamic. It's the most healing course that I offer and have offered, and it has been very acclaimed by the students who have gone through it so far. So we're really looking forward to opening the doors again. It's a touchy subject, you know, it's not the most fun thing to, to, to look at or to 
visit in yourself, but the results can be profound when you figure out how you got yourself into giving your power away in the first place, how to recover from the fact that you did it, and then how to avoid doing it again in the future. So I hope you'll join us for Empaths vs. Narcissists 2020. You can visit empathsvsnarcissists.com to find out more details about the full course.